Well, praise the Lord. You guys look great this morning. Um, we're coming back in to this series. And so, so today, uh, we're planning for this to be our last message in this Say Yes series. And, um, you know, I'll just say this to you, man. This whole series of Say Yes, in some ways, it's, it's a series that says, man, we're going into a new season of ministry. September, you know, everybody's back from school. I said all of those things probably the first week. And, and the church begins to come back alive after, after everyone gets back from the lake and the beach and vacations. And so, you know, there, there's a part of Say Yes that says, man, we need people to serve in different areas, in kids, in discipleship, in worship, whatever, all of the areas. But that's not what this is all about. And I don't want you to ever walk away from here thinking that, that this is all about, well, we need you in a spot, so let's do a da-da-da. What I want you to get out of this series is that God has created you. You are his workmanship. You are created in Christ Jesus to do good works. God prepared in advance for you to do these things. And when we talk about it, compassion, how, how it's our goal, it's our vision, for this to be a church where people who are lost can be saved and then freed, and then restored, and then fulfilled. I just believe that the church plays a big role in that. And I believe that your participation in church, finding the things that you can do that can help other people, that can serve, is going to play a large part in you finding your way to that fulfillment. But here's what I also know. There's a lot of people that come to church every week that, that serving in some area may be the last thing on your mind. You may be here today because you just came to, because somebody's been wearing you out about coming. You may be here today because it's a routine and it's a ritual and this is what you do. Or you may be here today because you're desperate for help. You may be desperate for hope. There may be seasons and situations that you're dealing with that maybe nobody knows. You might be that person who is so good at putting on the smile. Good morning. Yes, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Ain't God good? Yes, he is. And everything inside of you is broken in a million pieces. And you don't see how Humpty Dumpty could ever be put back together again. Well, if that's you this morning, I'm so glad you're here. I've been praying all week, man, about this, this message. And praying that God would bring people to this room today to hear this word, to let God apply his healing to your life. And I want to begin by saying this to you. There are lots of places that you can go. And you can, you can buy a ton of books, right? You can watch Dr. Phil. Oprah will give you some good advice. There's lots of places that you can go and you can figure out how you can put together a list of things that you can do to help yourself to get better. But you're not going to get better the way that you will when you allow God into your life and you let him do what he wants to do and you let him heal what's broken. And when you get to that place where you can just lay your life down before him and say, God, Whatever your will is. If I got to go through this thing, then here's what I know. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. And I believe there's some folks here today that need to hear the Holy Spirit of God say to you that you're not alone in your suffering and in your struggle, that God is with you. And there is a process that you, can, that you can work through or you can at least acknowledge or you can watch it happen that's going to help you to say yes to a new day. Now, let me just ask you this right now. A little participation time. If you, if you would like to see today be the beginning, uh, a brand new day in your life, raise your hand right now. I want a brand new day. Yeah, 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 yeah. Come on. Let's just thank God in advance for what he's about to do there. Put your hands together. Come on. In faith, clap your hands and say, God, I'm receiving what you're about to do. God, we're believing in you. That's what we're going to do. All right. So, man, we all get it that... Um, I say we all get it. Maybe you get it. God has a plan for you. God loves you, and he wants to do amazing things in your life. But can we just agree, man, that life is hard, right? We, we hear that God wants to do these amazing things, but man, it's hard out there. Bills are coming in. I mean, where are the dads in the house? Because somebody turn a light bulb off. Come on, somebody. 42 rooms in the house, and, and 18 of them got a fan blowing, and ain't nobody in it. Come on, turn the fan off, turn the light off. People getting sick, man, people that we love die. We, we have people that disappoint us. We have natural disasters that, that happen. All of these things, man, life is hard. 
Speaking of natural disasters, let me just throw this in. I'm excited today because there's a team from right here. Uh, seven of us are going uh, this afternoon, right after the second service, leaving, going to Valdosta, Georgia, where Chris Childs, who's part of our church, uh, is leading a team. This will be the fourth week that God's pit crew has been in Valdosta, Georgia, cleaning up from a hurricane. Would y'all pray for us over this next week while we're down there cutting trees and doing that thing? But, but, but that's part of it, man. Life is hard. Things happen that we don't understand. And one of the things that I love about the Bible is that the Bible's not made up of people who were sitting around eating Lucky Charms and, and, you know, and, and just having a great time in life. The Bible is made up of people that God chose to remember their stories and write it down so the generations can see it, of people who really struggle. And I want to take just a few minutes in the, in the beginning portion of this message. I want to take you back. Maybe, maybe you know these stories. But can I remind you that whatever you're going through, God has chosen people throughout history to write their stories and to leave them in the print in your Bible so that you can be reminded of how he stepped into their lives. What are you talking about, Jeff? Well, let's look at it. King David. Man, King David is a giant of the faith, but he dealt with depression. David dealt with depression. Look at Psalm 38. These are the words of David. David lived a thousand years before Jesus. And David lived an amazing life. God did great things through him. Remember that God chose David to be the second king of, of Israel. After Saul, David stepped in and God used him to conquer and to do all of these things. But David lost his way. David gave in to that voice of, of temptation that led to sin, that ultimately led to death. Not death in the physical life, not for David, it would eventually, but the death of his peace, the death of his joy. Look at what David says in Psalm 38. He says, my guilt has overwhelmed me like a burden too heavy to bear. My wounds fester and are loathsome because of my sinful folly. That's my foolishness. Why did I do this stupid thing? I am bowed down and brought very low all day long. I go about mourning. This is the king. This is the king who has conquered and done so many amazing things, but, but in one moment of foolishness. See, it really wasn't one moment. It was a season that led up to, to his pride, said, said, you've done so many things, and now you deserve, and, and you deserve, so go do whatever you want to. And that woman, that Bathsheba that's out there bathing and naked and is married to this man, you can have her if you want her. And his pride said, go get her, and he did. And he indulged all of that. And then it all crept in on him. And what crept in on him was a man who had favor with God, a man who was a man of integrity, a man who had done a lot of things right and been used in mighty ways, found himself in a place where his grief overwhelmed him. He was depressed because people talked about him. He was depressed because he had, he had put, a, put a space, a gap between him and God because of his actions. You ever been there? You ever, you ever made some bad decisions and then you got to live with that thing? That's where David was. Can I tell you something? If, you're, if that registers with you this morning, you think, man, why in the world did I come to church today? They got to talk about that of all things. God wasn't done with David. <laughs> he would still bring him around to do great things and to be a father of a great nation. Can I tell you something? I don't know what your thing is. I don't know what you did. I don't know what that thing is that chews all that stuff up inside of you, but God's not finished with you. Come on, somebody say amen right there. God's not finished with you. There are chapters still to be written. David dealt with that depression. Elijah was suicidal. Suicidal. We don't even like to say that word, do we? We don't want to think about it. Man, it's all around us. It's like this thing that seems to get more prevalent year after year. It's not anything new. Elijah was suicidal. Jackie preached a few weeks ago about Elijah, and she told this whole story of how in one chapter, Elijah takes on the prophets of Baal who are proclaiming that their God is God. And he's like, y'all chumps, y'all don't even know God. And he calls down fire from heaven and destroys all those prophets of Baal, and he wins a great victory. But then after that great victory, uh, Jezebel begins to threaten him and tell him she's going to kill him. And so he takes off running because this woman said, I'm going to kill you. And he was suicidal. Look at his words, man. First King 19, he says, I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. And I don't know. I don't know if this is true or not, but I can guess that, that with Elijah, you know, we talk about this acronym sometimes. Maybe you've heard this, the acronym HALT. It says never get too hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. Because if you do, you get too hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, you're headed for disaster. 
Well, my guess is that in all of the running and all of the fighting the prophets of Baal and all of that, Elijah more than likely got too hungry, angry, lonely, and tired. And when this woman threatened him and he knew that she had done terrible things in the past, all he heard was the voice of fear. And the voice of fear says, do you know what she's going to do to you? Can I just say to you right now, if you're that person in here this morning and the voice of fear is saying, I've had enough, take my life, Lord. God forbid, first of all, that any of you are thinking that today. But if that's where you are, can I just say to you, Elijah lost sight of the voice of his God who had shown up just before that and delivered him from the prophets of Baal. All he could hear was the voice of fear. Maybe today, if depression and suicide and all of those things are weighing in on you, may, maybe you've got to find a way to re-engage your mind to hear the voice of God. What's he going to say? He's going to say, listen, listen, listen. This battle you're in, it's not your fight. You're in it. But if you'll let me, I will fight Jezebel, Ahab, whoever for you. If you'll let me, I will step in. Why don't you rest and let me fight? Does that sound good to anybody out here this morning? Check this thing on. Anybody need God to fight for you? That's what he's saying, man. That's what he's saying. Jonah. Jonah ran from God. Jonah ran from God. God said to Jonah, man, there are people in the city of Nineveh, and it's become such a pagan city. Everybody there is worshiping false gods. They don't care anything about me. Somebody's got to go tell them. Jonah, go tell them. Look at what Jonah's response is in Jonah 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. God, help us. Don't let the wickedness of Dan will come before God. But Jonah ran away from the Lord. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After, praying, after paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. God says go to Nineveh. Jonah says, okay, nope, not doing that. I will go this way. Don't even like those people. Don't have anything to do with them. God, you deal with them. What? I told you to go this way. And my guess is there's probably some of you in here this morning that you know that there's something that God's told you to do whether it was yesterday or whether it was 10 years ago. And you've been steady telling God, nope, I ain't going to do it. God, I don't care. I'm not doing it. I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to. And instead of going into what God's called you to, you're running away from it. Well, what Jonah experienced was misery and struggle and all kinds of terrible things happened to him when he ran. But what you find when you go into the thing, regardless of how absurd it may seem, it was absurd for Jonah to go to Nineveh and tell these people about God. They're going to kill me. No, they're not, because I'm God. Some of you have your mind made up that it's ridiculous for you to do the thing that God's put in your mind, and you don't have any peace in your life because you're saying no to God. Remember what this season is? This is a season of yes. And when you start saying yes to God, what you're going to find is God goes before you. He works it out for you. I asked Elliot coming in uh, earlier this morning, I said, have you had a good week? He said, man, I always have a good week. He said, Romans 8, 28 says, God causes all things to work together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purposes. I said, man, take this microphone. You preach this morning. You're saying more than I can. Job. Y'all know the struggles of Job. Y'all are looking at me like, man, I've heard all these stories. I know you have, but I want to remind you of some things this morning. Job experienced great loss. Man, look at this. Job Chapter 30, verse 15 says, Terror, Job's words, terrors overwhelm me. My dignity is driven away as by the wind. My safety vanishes like a cloud. And now my life ebbs away. Days of suffering grip me. Night pierces my bone. My growing pains never rest. Man, this brother's in a hard place. He is in a hard, hard, hard place. This is a man who might have been the wealthiest man alive at the time. He had everything. He had family. People respected him. He had integrity. And, and, and in just a moment, just like that, he lost his family. It's easy to say that and just keep rolling right through that. But he lost all of his children. He lost his health. Said that these, these big great boils came up all over him. 
And they were very painful. It said he sat around day after day with a broken piece of pottery, like a, a thick piece of pottery just scraping his wounds, scraping his arms, trying to get some relief. He lost his wealth. He had vast herds, and it was all gone in just a moment. He lost his integrity. His friends were questioning him. You ever been there? Ever felt like everybody in the world has turned against you? Man, maybe even worse than that. Job began to question whether the God that he had loved his whole life and served, has God even turned his back on me? See, Job was in a, a season of silence with God. But can I say to you this morning, if you're in a season where it seems that no matter how much you pray, God's not responding to you, it's not because he doesn't hear you. He's giving you time to get all of that out. He's giving you time to see how you're going to, whether, whether you're going to react or are you going to respond to this thing. Are you going to react to your situation and cry and scream and suck your thumb and, and curl up in a fetal position and cuss at the moon? Or are you going to respond and say, well, this is where I am. I'm going to wait on the Lord. The Lord has promised me that he has me. God, when are you going to show up? God, if you don't show up today, I know you're coming tomorrow. He's going to wait on you to see. Job experienced great loss, man. He was terrified. He was ashamed. He was in pain. Then there's Moses. Moses was overwhelmed. Ha! Some of y'all will get this, man. Moses was minding his own business out in the wilderness. God shows up in a burning bush, right? Says, go speak to Pharaoh. Set my people free. He's like, you got to be kidding me. I am not the one. Yes, you are. Get over there. Do it. He does it. God sets them through free. Only God could do that. <coughs> and now Moses finds himself in a place where, where he is the leader over a million plus people. And they all come into him. I love this. Look at, look at Numbers 11. He asked the Lord, why have you brought this terrible trouble on your servant? Any, got any leaders, anybody? Any, anybody here supervise some people in your Monday through Friday kind of deal, right? Why have you brought this on me? What, what have I done to displease you that you put the burden of all these people on me? Then he starts asking God some questions. Did I conceive all these people? Did I give them birth? Why did you tell me to carry them in my arms like a nurse carries an infant to the land you promised on earth to their forefathers? He's like, God, I was happy, man. I was good before all this came along. God said, yeah, well, too bad. That's over. This is where we are now. He's overwhelmed. And God, you know, this is the beautiful thing about God. God will let you say those things to him. You ever heard anybody say it's okay to fuss at God? He's big enough to take it. Right there it is. And he stayed right there with him. Jeremiah, last one, Jeremiah wept because of constant rejection. God called Jeremiah to go to a people who had completely given up on God. And he said, go and proclaim my name to them. And Jeremiah did what God had called him to do. And they still mocked him and made fun of him. Look at the verse there. I am ridiculed all day long. Everyone mocks me. Whenever I speak, I cry out, proclaiming violence and destruction. I just want to say to you this morning, it's not going to be easy. Following God is not always going to be easy, but it will be fruitful. And it will grow you, and he will take you into, into places you never dreamed. You might think, well, my life is good right now. Maybe this is where you're supposed to be, and maybe it's not. Maybe if it's simple and easy, when you look around and you think, who am I helping? Am I making a difference? Maybe God wants to ratchet it up. Maybe you're in that ratcheted up season right now. And you're thinking, what in the world is going on? And this is where I want to transition this morning. As I was preparing this message, I felt like God said, say this. Go to this topic this morning. And God began bringing faces to my mind of people in this congregation. He began bringing names to my mind of those of you, some of you, I don't know everybody's story, but, but some of you have gone through great tragedy, great loss, things that you never would have dreamed would have happened. Life was cruising along, and then boom, the big bomb drops. The day hits, and you're left picking up the pieces. And there's some of you right here, right now, who are still picking up pieces, trying to put it all together. And then I was reminded of 2013, Rick Warren, a lot of you know who Rick Warren is, pastor and founder of Saddleback Church. He's recently uh, given up his leadership role there, retired, so to speak. But, but in 2013, Rick and Kay Warren had a son whose name was Matthew, who had struggled with mental health for, for I guess, all of his life. And it's well documented that, that Matthew Warren, in 2013, took his own life. And, and in that, 
Rick and Kay Warren took a step back for a season, and they were quiet. They, someone else pastored the church, spoke every week. But when they came back, and I would encourage every one of you if, you, if you, if you're looking for something to encourage you, something to make sense of it all, go watch the, the message. You can find it on YouTube, the sermon, the first sermon that Rick and Kay Warren gave when they came back after Matthew's death. Out of that, I won't go through the whole thing, but one thing I wanted to share with you today is what Rick and Kay Warren have presented as the six stages of stress. Six stages of stress. Now, now you, I've told people lots of times who have lost someone recently going through uh, their world has just been turned upside down. I've told people lots of times the, the grief cycle, you're familiar with the grief cycle, it's undefeated. It just is. I mean, you're going to struggle with things. And that grief cycle, what I've seen with it is that, that there are people who, when someone, a close loved one dies and it's sudden and they don't expect it and grief just overwhelms them. You will either engage the grief in that moment and you will mourn and it's going to suck and it's going to be awful and it's going to be terrible and it's going to rip your guts out. You'll either do it in the moment or you'll figure out how to get busy. Keep your mind busy, keep your hands busy, and you'll push away and you'll think that, that you've just dealt with it. And all you've done is shoved it down. And at the most inopportune time, that grief is going to come back 10 times harder than it was. Now, what am I telling you? Well, I'm telling you it's better to deal with it on the front end, but, but we don't all know how to do that. The grief cycle is going to tell you how to deal with things on your own. The six stages of stress, and I can't stress this enough, I want you to get this, the six stages of stress is going to show you how to just stand behind God as you go through this and watch what God wants to do with your broken season. If you are heartbroken today, maybe you've lost someone you love, maybe you've just, uh, a marriage has ended, maybe it's a financial thing, maybe a, whatever it is that's causing you to be heartbroken, I want you to see these six stages. Let's look at them. Um, number one, the first stage is shock. The stage of shock. The big boom has just happened. Something that I didn't see coming. I didn't anticipate it. Life was this way one day, and the big boom happened, and now I don't know how I'm going to make it. I, I don't know how life will ever be good again. Can it be good again? Am I going to survive this? Shock, man. Your eyes are open, and everything's crazy. What do you need in that moment? When you're struggling with shock, what you need is companions. You need people around you that love you, trust you, and will help you. Um, Ecclesiastes 4. This, I'm, I'm going to quote some verses in this part. It's not going to be on the screen. But, but Ecclesiastes 4 is, a, is a, a very familiar passage that says two are better than one. How can one keep warm if he lies down alone? But then it goes on to say a cord of three strands is not easily broken. What's going to happen when you get to that shock moment is all of a sudden everything is crazy. And there are going to be people around you it's going to say, how are you doing? Man, are you okay? Are you all right? And you're going to get so sick of everybody asking you, how are you? You're going to want to not talk to anybody. Your, your, your instinct is going to be to isolate. You don't want to go to Walmart. You don't want to look up and see people that are smiling. You don't want to see, you don't want to see the, the, what's the word? Um, um, it's not even compassion. People, people look at you and they pity you. Like, don't pity me. I'm not somebody, that's, that's, that's that shock moment. And what you need are companions. And, and it might not be that you need them there to, to, to tell you what to do. They, like like one, of, one of the worst seasons I ever went through, I can tell you that the people that I can remember are the people that showed up in my house. And instead of talking about what had just happened, we talked about something that made me laugh. Right? It, it took my mind off of things. There's this thing called the ministry of presence. If you've ever been to a funeral home and you go through that line and the person's standing up there and you're, you see them standing like right here and you're coming down the side, you're like, man, I don't, I don't even know what to say. I don't even know what to say. We've all been there. You know what's important? Being there. You're not going to say something that's going to change it. It's called the ministry of presence. Show up, hug them. If, if they need their grass mowed and you see it, go do that. But, but you need companions when you're in that shock state. Second thing, second stage is, is sorrow. The stage of sorrow is it's starting to hit me now. Um, Psalm 61, again, not in your, in your outline there, but Psalm 61, again, David, hear my cry, O God. Listen to my prayer from the ends of the earth. I call to you. It feels like you're at the end of the earth when your life is crashed in. But he says, I call as my heart grows faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. 
Why is that important? Because when you're going through sorrow, what you need is worship. You say, well, that don't even make sense, Jeff. How do you expect me to worship? No, 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 listen, it does make sense. If you've ever been in that place, man, and your world has gotten turned upside down, look, you don't care if the Cowboys are playing. You don't care if there's ever another football game on again, right? You, you don't care about going to work. Well, it'll, it'll happen or it won't happen. All you can see is the ground that you're work, walking on in that moment. All you can feel is what you feel because of what's happened. Your whole world becomes about this thing, this event, this, this death, this divorce, this, this, this kid, this whatever it is. But when you worship, what that causes you to do is instead of looking at my circumstances and, and the ground I'm standing on, I will lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. I am not just right here anymore. God is with me. I need to worship. And can I tell you from experience, it might be the hardest thing you've ever done. When your heart is broken and you feel like, God, why did you allow this into my life? And then God says to you, worship me. He's not doing that out of some kind of narcissistic thing. Remember this, our God is perfect and he was perfect love. And in his perfect love, he knows that if he can get you to proclaim his name and to proclaim his goodness, that the healing can begin and you can begin to invite him in. And instead of thinking that I have to handle this all on my own, God must have forgotten me. I've, I've got to get through this. Nobody cares. Why did God allow this to happen? Instead of those kinds of thoughts, you begin to think, God, I need you. And in that sorrow, man, you, you need God. The third stage is the stage of struggle. It's the stage of struggle. And so maybe a couple of days have gone by now. Maybe the, the funeral home ordeal is over with, right? Maybe the papers have been signed and, and life is trying to get back to some sense of normalcy. But it's not normal. And everybody else seems to be going on with the football games and the, and the fall fair and the, let's do this thing at church. And, and you're going through the motions, but it's a struggle. And sometimes, man... I don't know how you are, but I found myself in this place at times when I've been in that season where, where the day is so long. And at nighttime, I just long for the ability to close my eyes and go to sleep. And I hope I stay asleep for a while so I don't have to deal with the thoughts that I'm dealing with right then. That's the struggle. Well, what do I need when I'm in the struggle? When I'm in the struggle, I need hope. I need hope, man. I need hope that... I need something to remind me that there is a reality that what I'm struggling with right now, it is what I'm dealing with right now. And it's terrible and it's awful, but it's not the way it's always going to be. I need hope that things will get better, that it can get better, right? Proverbs 13, 12 says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. In other words, if, if I don't see there's any hope, man, my heart gets sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. Well, how do you get that longing fulfilled? Well, that's the next stage. And the next stage, step four, stage four is the stage of surrender. And what I need there is I need to trust God. Sounds so simple, doesn't it? Sounds so simple, but when it's time for me to surrender, you can almost picture these stages like a bell curve and you're getting up to the top of it. And when you begin to surrender, now you can begin the process of sliding down the other side. What does surrender look like? It's like you get to this place like, man, I can't believe what has happened. I am shocked that this has happened in my life. And I've been struggling with it and I'm feeling this sorrow, but it is what it is. And y'all laugh at me because I've said don't say that. But this is one of those moments where it really is what it is. The thing has happened. What am I going to do? Well, I know how limited I am in my own ability, but I've got to trust God. And if I could peel open my skin and let you guys look right in here, there's this thing that's been tattooed on my soul, I think. And it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. <laughs> trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight can't tell you how many times I've been in that in that moment of struggle and God's telling me if you'll let if you'll just surrender if you'll just trust me and when you begin trusting God you know what that does for you it shows you that you don't have to do everything on your own all the things that seem impossible I can't get over this I can't move forward I can't fix things I can't make it right God says you know what you're right you can't but I can but you got to invite me in and that's surrender surrender is getting to that place where you say okay God 
I give up. I can't do this on my own. I need you. And some of you need to be in that place this morning. Some of you continue the struggle because, because you think, man, I don't know, God. I don't know. So much has happened. Where were you, God? You ever say that? Where were you, God? God, why don't you do this? Why don't you do this? Maybe God's not doing those things because you have chosen to not trust him yet. Maybe God stepping into your season begins with you having the faith to believe. Regardless of what's happened, God, it all looks like chaos. It looks like a jumbled up mess of spaghetti and I can't make heads or tails of it. But I need you. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. Your own understanding tells you that it's never coming back. It's never going to be the same. God's going to tell you, you're right. It's not going to be the same, but it can be different. It can be better. It can be good again. Don't lean on your own understanding. Lean on God. And then sanctification is the fifth stage. Sanctification, I need to embrace the sharpening. You say, what does that mean, Jeff? What is sanctification? You ever seen one of these guys that has a, has a, a big old tree trunk log-like thing? He takes that chainsaw and he starts carving on, he starts cutting stuff away. He gets to the end of it, man, and that thing's got a bear coming out of it. Or, or he makes Tonto out of it, right? He carves something out of that big tree trunk with a chainsaw. What's he doing? That's what the process of sanctification looks like. It's a process of cutting away all of the old to reveal what's under. See, God has a plan. God has a purpose. And God either causes everything to happen or he allows everything to happen. And if he allows it to happen in your life, you better know that he's walking in that thing with you. Matter of fact, he's walking ahead of you. And he's going to cut things out of your life so that he can reveal a strength that you may never have known that you had. He's going to cut things out of your life so that you can connect with him and see a purpose that you never knew that he had for your life. That process of sanctification is not easy. But when you embrace it and you say, okay, God, I give up. Whatever you want to do with my life. Maybe I thought it was going to look like this and it'll never look like that. But God, I take my hands off of it. Let me say that again. Some of y'all are holding on to your own life so hard holding on to your past, what used to be. You're scratching and clawing, trying to get back what has already been gone for a long time. But when you let go of that thing, say, God, you cut it out of me. You must see something else that you want to do. Then he begins to do something. And it leads to the last thing, the sixth, sixth step, and it's the step of service. And that step of service is a beautiful thing because that's where I learned that I need to turn my pain into purpose. I turn my pain into purpose. What do you mean, Jeff? I see it in y'all all the time. There's so many of you in here right now that you've been through things in your life and you didn't know if you would be able to survive. You didn't know if you'd ever see another day come out of it. But God brought you through it. And now you sing a song and now you tell a story and now you look for people who are going through what you went through and you just, you just want to help somebody. And you want to say to somebody, yes, I did go through that. And yes, it did suck. And I see what you're going through and it's terrible and it's awful. But let me walk alongside of you. Let me show you how God can help you in your life. And in that service that you find, man, you'll find that there is purpose to your pain. Yeah, God lets you go through it. But he lets you go through it for your good and for his glory. And he lets you go through it to help someone else. And I look around this church and I see so many people who have endured so many hard things. And God's not giving up on you. He's working ahead of you. You don't even see how he's doing things, but he's doing them. And I also look around this church and I see so many people who are hurting. And it makes me think, there are some of you who have not yet stepped into saying yes. Why do we still not have a divorce care class for people whose hearts are broken because of divorce? Who's going to step up and lead a grief share class when, when season after season after season we have people whose hearts are broken and they don't know how to deal with the grief? And so we turn to pills and we turn to putting guns in our mouth and we turn to running away from the church. All the things that the enemy wants to use and the church is sitting right here with people who have been through it and been healed from it. Who's going to do that? Who's going to lead discipleship classes that teach people that Jesus loves you? See, God wants to turn your pain into purpose. 
And when I say say yes to you today, there's some of you this morning that need to say yes to letting God take you into a new season. And the way that you do that is by letting go. The way that you do that is by saying, God, I do trust you. There are others in here that need to step into a new season by saying, God, I can't believe that you brought me through the hardest season of my life. But I see exactly what you've done in my life. And I see my friend that's hurting. Can I help them? God, will you open a door that will allow me to start a conversation? Can we start a friendship? Can we start a relationship? Can you use what you've used in my life to help that person? Every person in this room, you're on one of those sides. You either need the help to get through it or you need to be helping someone get through it. Would you stand to your feet right now?